certainly not uh, all of you, uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to serve as acting dean this semester at the uh, S.J. Quinney College of Law while our uh, regular off in uh, New Zealand. Uh, and let me assure you, he's doing academic uh, things uh, while uh, he's in New Zealand. Uh, and let me also observe that I'm uh, pleased to see that uh, most of you are sitting in the front of this lecture hall rather than as our students regularly do in class, uh, sitting in the back uh, uh, of the hall. So let me, uh, let me say that I'm delighted on behalf of the College of Law uh, to welcome you to the 52nd annual William H. Leary uh, Lecture, which is uh, uh, truly a seminal event, uh, as most of you know, here at uh, the law school. Uh, over the years, uh, the college's uh, Leary Lecture Series has brought to the law school such luminaries and thought-provoking speakers as Justices Roger Traynor, William Brennan, and Thomas Clark, some of the most eminent uh, law faculty in the country, including Professors Walter Gellhorn, Kenneth Culp Davis, Joe Sachs, Bruce Ackerman, Martha Minow, Martha Feynman, Duncan Kennedy, Richard Epstein, Carol Rose, Harold Coe, and Yale's uh, Tracy Mears, who was our 51st annual Leary Lecturer last year. Uh, in addition, uh, Law Dean's Jefferson Fordham, Jess Choper, Paul Brest, and Erwin Chemerinsky uh, have uh, spoken uh, here at the Leary Lecture. Uh, speaking of deans, uh, let me say a few words about uh, William uh, Leary, who served as the dean of this law school for a remarkable 36 years, from 1915 to 1951, uh, which means that Dean Leary led the College of Law through the terms and this strikes me as amazing, of five United States presidents, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was the dean through the First World War, the Great Depression, World War II, and on into uh, the Cold War. So uh, as we ponder the critical legal issues of our own times, it's sobering uh, and perhaps comforting to reflect on the challenging issues that were encountered uh, during these uh, troubled times, uh, troubled years when Dean Leary uh, helped to navigate uh, our students and others uh, through uh, those times. Dean Leary was himself a graduate of Amherst College and of the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, he was appointed the second uh, dean here at the University of Utah Law School. Uh, seven years after he himself graduated from law school at the age of, uh, and he was appointed dean at the age of 34. And uh, during his tenure, he became a foundational figure in the history of our law school. He designed our core curriculum, was legendary for his compassion for his students. Most prominently, uh, he insisted that the College of Law should serve as a place of intellectual freedom both in our university and uh, our state. Uh, he once wrote that he would like, quote, like to see freer discussion of philosophical questions, a broader, more tolerant attitude, a deeper respect for others, a richer culture, and a truly intellectual atmosphere. For more than a century now, uh, this lecture has honored those aspirations for civil and respectful dialogue on even the most divisive issues, and it's a tradition that we continue tonight. Uh, to introduce uh, this evening's uh, speaker, I've asked our own Professor Ronell Anderson-Jones, who is herself an accomplished constitutional law scholar in the area of First Amendment press freedom. She's also the Lee Teitelbaum Professor of Law, another one of our deans, uh, and a longtime friend with tonight's speaker. And so she will introduce uh, our speaker. Ronell. Okay, I'm delighted to have the chance uh, to introduce tonight's lecturer, who is an amazing scholar and a wonderful friend. Uh, before I do, I uh, want to remind you that we'll be using the Slido app again tonight to curate and organize our questions for the Q&A section. 
of uh, the evening. Um, please feel free to download the app. The information uh, is here on the screen. So if you haven't um, downloaded it at previous events, you can download it now and then enter in our event code, which is also listed on the screen. Once you've done that, uh, you'll be able to easily uh, add potential questions to the queue as they come to your mind uh, during the lecture itself so that we can have them ready uh, when we move to Q&A. Um, and you can also participate in real time in the conversation um, after, it con after the lecture concludes. Uh, if you uh, do not currently have with you a smartphone, I assume that our lecturer is going to um, explain why you're in better Fourth Amendment shape than the rest of us, but uh, you also aren't excluded from participating in the Q&A. Lori, where is Lori? Here, um, has a device uh, with her there that you can use if you're interested in submitting a question and you don't have a phone available to do so. Um, we'll sort the questions for the most relevant and most popular so that we can get the most out of our time together with our guests. Our Leary lecturer uh, tonight is Professor Oren Kerr, the Francis R. and John J. Duggan uh, Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. He is the nation's leading authority on internet surveillance, uh, computer crime law, and criminal procedure, and is a remarkable public intellectual, a celebrated teacher, and a gifted and accomplished lecturer. Uh, Professor Kerr graduated from Princeton University and received his master's degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford and his law degree from Harvard where he was executive editor of Harvard, law, uh, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. He clerked for Judge Leonard Garth of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and for Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. He came to USC uh, just earlier this year, uh, six weeks in the LA sunshine so far. Uh, leaving behind George Washington University Law School. He's also been a visiting professor at the University of Chicago and the University of Pennsylvania Law Schools. A prolific writer and respected scholar, Professor Kerr is the author of more than 50 articles, a very popular casebook, and is among the most cited of any uh, criminal law and criminal procedure scholar in the country. His scholarship has been cited in more than 2,500 articles and 250 judicial opinions. Professor Kerr has argued cases in federal circuit courts and before the United States Supreme Court. He served as a Justice Department attorney in the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section and was a pro bono lawyer for the defendant in a recent high profile case against Facebook. Professor Kerr served uh, U.S. Senator John Cornyn and, of the Senate Judiciary Committee as special counsel for Supreme Court nominations during the confirmation proceedings of both Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Elena Kagan. He was appointed by Chief Justice John Roberts to serve on the Advisory Committee for the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure and the Judicial Conferences Committee to review the Criminal Justice Act. He also researched information technology, privacy, and criminal justice during a two-year appointment as a scholar in residence at the Library of Congress. On a personal note, I've had the privilege of calling Professor Kerr my friend for more years than either of us might like to admit. We clerked simultaneously for Justices Kennedy and O'Connor at the Supreme Court. Oren's situation was a little unique because while a number of us there as law clerks were fresh out of law school, he came to the clerkship from his post at George Washington where he'd already been a junior professor for a couple of years. I remember some of us initially feeling utterly in awe that the guy um, in the chambers down the hall was a real life grown up professor. Uh, and it was nothing short of remarkable that the person who so intimidated all of us at the outset turned out to be the most modest, approachable, warm, genuine person in the building. I cherish the memories that we made that year, and I cherish the friendship that we've sustained in the years since. You have no idea how lucky you are to get to listen to him and to learn from him tonight. I'm so grateful that he's doing us the honor. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Professor Oren Kerr. Ranel, I want to take you with me wherever I go to do, uh, do introductions. That was, thank you. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be here. When I was invited uh, to give this talk, I was very honored uh, to do so, uh, in part because I have so many friends on the faculty here, and I want to give just a couple of shout outs to uh, colleagues who I know and whose work I've greatly admired. Uh, Ranel Anderson Jones, who you've just heard from, uh, of course, I've known, I think, for the longest uh, as we were law clerks together. Uh, and then Shima Bradarin Boffman, a uh, uh, criminal law professor here. I've been reading her new book, The Bail Book. I recommend it to you. Uh, terrific uh, new book, just came out a few weeks ago, I think. 
Uh, Matthew Toxin, who's here uh, as well, uh, there he is, uh, a terrific Fourth Amendment scholar in his own right who should be up here with me. We could do this as a debate, I think, as easily uh, as, as the way we're going to do it uh, here. Uh, who, his work was uh, discussed during the oral argument in the Carpenter case and may end up being cited in the opinion that, that comes, so uh, uh, it's, he's very influential and important, and I'm delighted to be here with him in, in particular. Uh, and then finally, uh, whenever I think of Utah, I think of the home of uh, former Judge Paul Cassell, uh, also on the faculty whose work I've greatly admired uh, and who uh, I have a long-standing relationship with as a co-blogger. Uh, we've blogged together on the same blog, The Volk Conspiracy, for many years. And I guess in the internet age, being a co-blogger with somebody is actually kind of like a, it's a thing. So, so that, being amongst, amongst friends like that is really, is really terrific. And, and what I have to say is one of the most beautiful new buildings I've seen uh, at a law school. I've just started at a, a new school, University of Southern California, which is wonderful. Uh, and it's building, uh, let's just say it, it's vintage. Uh, vintage about 1970, unfortunately, uh, and this, this is, not that that's a terrible era, I was born around then, but um, uh, uh, this is a beautiful building, really, really lovely to be here, especially with the Slido technology, this is totally new to me, but I love it, um, it's a great way to get, get, get questions in. Okay, so the topic uh, for tonight is a pending Supreme Court case, Carpenter versus United States. Uh, and I feel a little bit like I'm telling a mystery, like giving a mystery story or reading a mystery novel to you without the end, uh, because the case hasn't come down yet. Uh, and so ordinarily, when you're talking about an important Supreme Court case, you can say, here's what the court held, and here's why it's important. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about here's, what the court, uh, here's why this case is important, no matter what the court holds. And how much is at stake in this one case, which happens to be about cell site surveillance, but is really about all digital privacy, privacy rights online, privacy rights in the future. Uh, the one case Carpenter is really a perfect storm of a bunch of themes of Fourth Amendment law and a lot of uncertainty as to what the scope of the constitutional prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures means. And it's all coming uh, to this, this one place, this one case Carpenter. And, and, and the justices, I think, uh, realize that. They realize this is a big case. They, they arranged for oral argument in this case to be uh, uh, on a particular day, conveniently scheduled uh, in Washington, D.C. before I moved to Southern California. I personally appreciated that. Uh, but it was the only oral argument that day, and the Chief Justice began in a way I've never heard the Chief Justice begin an argument. At the outset, he said, I want to give you both extra time. I'm sure you'll fill it up. Um, ordinarily, oral arguments at the Supreme Court, 30 minutes aside, you get maybe a sentence more than, than, than that, but that's it. Uh, uh, and to begin an argument by saying, I'm going to give everybody more time, basically means this is big. This, this matters a lot. So uh, I want to talk uh, uh, about the Carpenter case. And in order to do that, I need to frame what the Fourth Amendment is about, because we're really talking about the application of existing principles of law to a new technology, uh, cell phone surveillance, uh, and um, you're probably familiar with the basic idea of cell phones. Most of you have cell phones in your pockets, if not in your hands. I felt particularly good. I realized whenever I you know, talk about this topic, I can bring my cell phone with me, and I don't feel bad that I have my cell phone with me. It's like, this is quite all right. I have put it on airplane mode, in case you're wondering. Although the reason is not to stop surveillance of me. It's just so you know, I don't get a phone call or something like that that interrupts the talk. Um, but you're familiar with, with cell phones, probably less familiar with cell phone surveillance. So let me talk a little bit about the technology uh, and then the, the legal principles, and then I'll try to, to match them together. So uh, whenever your cell phone is on, your cell phone is trying to contact local cell towers in order to make or deliver or send communications. Cell phones don't work by magic. They work by connecting to a network. And they can connect to a network because there are local towers that are broadcasting signals, and whenever your phone is on, your phone tries to find a nearby cell tower, and it basically is saying, hey, cell tower, I'm here. If a call comes into my number, route it to me, uh, and if I need to make a call or, or send a text or any sort of uh, internet communication, I will do it through the cell tower. That's the basic idea. Um, this is something that I think surprised probably a few Supreme Court justices. There was an early case, uh, City of Ontario versus Kwan, maybe seven or eight years ago, uh, involving text messages that were sent. And, and it was clear during the oral argument that the justices 
had not been briefed on the technology very well. Uh, I think it was Chief Justice Roberts said, um, so how does it work? You, just, you send it from one device and it just goes cross country to the other device, like just directly to them? And, and then the lawyer had to say, no, it goes through the network. And the Chief Justice was like, well, the network? Um, and, and my own former boss, Justice Kennedy, he asked uh, if two text messages come in at the same time, uh, do they both bounce? Um, thinking it's sort of like it's a phone call, like two, two phone calls come in. You can't have two phone calls come in at the same time, but you know, text messages, it's a little, little bit different. Um, well, the way it works with cell phones is they're constantly connecting to cell towers. They need to do that just to be able to be connected to the network. So what that means is that cell phone providers that are routing calls have records, or they, their, their networks need to generate records about what cell towers were used to connect a call at any particular time. So when, for example, you turn on your cell phone and it says, you know, searching for a signal and then you hope you have five bars, that means you've got a good connection with the cell tower. And if it says searching or you don't get a signal, that means your phone is looking for a cell tower and it can't connect to one. Well, the cell phone companies keep records of what cell towers were used to connect different phones at different times. And it turns out they use this information for their own business purposes. They might want to optimize the network. They might want to know uh, which cell towers are being used a lot, which cell towers are being used less, uh, and, and which people are near which towers so they can adjust where the towers are, or whatever business purposes they might have to optimize how the network works. Those records are really valuable for law enforcement. Uh, imagine you are a police officer trying to reconstruct a crime. Most people are near their phones. Most people keep their phones in their pockets or their purses or at least you know, within, within a few feet of them. Uh, uh, and that means that if you know where the phone is, you probably know where the person is. And because those records have been created and exist, that means you can have historical records as to where somebody was located at times in the past. Now, it turns out modern cell phone technology is not uh, uh, the, the records are not you know, constant and perfectly detailed. Uh, the, the records based on current technology uh, are kept by different cell phone providers in slightly different circumstances. It might be whenever a call is made or a call is ended, that record has been generated, is kept. It may be when a text message comes in uh, or is sent that the cell tower record is, is kept of where, which tower was used for that particular uh, phone at that time. Uh, but those historical records exist as to which towers were used. Now, importantly, the location of the tower doesn't give you perfect information about the location of the phone. So cell towers are, you can think of it sort of like the neighborhood that the phone was in. in a particular area might have five towers or ten towers, and it's not always the case that the phone connects to the nearest tower. There may be technical reasons why the phone actually, the, the, the tower nearby is busy or there's a lot of traffic to it, so it gets a better signal from a, a, a signal that's further, uh, a tower that's further away. Uh, but in general, you're going to find that the phones typically are in the neighborhood of the, uh, of the towers, so the government might be able to find out in a criminal case, assuming the person is with their phone, that the person was, say, in a particular neighborhood at a particular time. How many records are created, it really just depends on how often the person used the phone. So uh, there was a Pew study a year or two ago that suggested that most adults make phone calls from their cell phones about six or seven times a day. Um, somebody who's, say, committing a crime using their phone, maybe you using it a lot more often than that to communicate with co-conspirators uh, who are also engaged in the offense. But there are a few records generated. That, though, is just one technology. You can imagine how quickly it changes if you have a different cell phone company that maybe creates and stores records every time a text message was sent. Well, a lot of people send a lot of text messages. Or how about whenever a text message was sent or received? Uh, or when the internet was used from the smartphone? The records that the companies keep is just their choice as to how often they want to keep these records. And so they're, keeping, they're generating records that they're storing typically for a long time. And the government can use those records to figure out where people were located, at least what neighborhood they're in, not what room they're in, but you know, they were 
say, on this campus or certainly in Salt Lake City or this part of, the, this, this part of town uh, at any given point in the past where a phone, at, at a time when the, a phone call was made or received. So the question uh, raised in the Carpenter case is what constitutional rules should apply when the government wants to get access to those historical records? Uh, in the Carpenter case, Carpenter was engaged in a series of robberies. Uh, in, a, in a delightful irony, he was stealing cell phones uh, <laughs> with some colleagues from a radio shack. If that makes it into the opinion, probably people aren't going to know what a radio shack is in a few years. Um, but uh, the whole idea of a radio might seem obsolete. Uh, but uh, so a Carpenter and a group of conspirators were engaged in a series of uh, stealing cell phones. And the government was able to obtain 127 days worth of cell phone location records, uh, his tower records, from the phones that Carpenter was using. Uh, and this was useful because the government was able to show that the members of the conspiracy always ended up in the neighborhood where a robbery occurred. So it didn't show that they were the robbers because it's not a crime to be in the neighborhood of a place where a robber occurs, but it's quite a coincidence for a group of people to be traveling around and whenever there's a robbery reported, it's an identical robbery, all of those cell phones all happen to be in the neighborhood at that particular time. And the government was able to figure this out because one member of the group uh, uh, went in and talked to the police and shared the cell phone numbers uh, uh, of all the members of the group with the police, and then they obtained orders and got, got these cell phone records. And the question in the case is whether the government needed a search warrant or at least some higher court order uh, uh, it, under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution in order to protect the privacy of the individuals as a matter of constitutional law. Was a warrant required? Does the Fourth Amendment apply? Uh, or is this something that is up to statutory law? So statutory law would be Congress, uh, legislatures, state legislatures. Uh, state, and state legislatures and Congress have uh, enacted a bunch of rules in this area. There actually is a court order requirement as a matter of federal law, but it's not a full search warrant requirement. A search warrant would require probable cause based, uh, uh, showing that there's a, a reasonable likelihood that the evidence to be obtained uh, is, is, is um, evidence of, of a crime. And so what are the rules that regulate the government boils down to, in substantial part, how does the Fourth Amendment apply? Now, at this point, a bunch of you are wondering, well, wait a minute, what is the Fourth Amendment? You need, I need to get into some detailed law here. So let me explain a little bit about the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and the theme here is going to be one of uncertainty. Uh, this particular problem of how the Fourth Amendment should apply to collecting uh, cell site records, that's what the records are called, ends up being a, a kind of a perfect storm uh, of uncertainties in Fourth Amendment law all coming to bear on this one particular case. So I need to talk about how the courts have interpreted the Fourth Amendment uh, and explain the themes of the Fourth Amendment and what the Fourth Amendment has been doing and the under, uh, uncertainties of that area of law. And then we can talk about how those uh, problems apply to the specific facts of the Carpenter case. OK, so the, the Fourth Amendment uh, says that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. That's the most important text. And I, I guess at this point, this is sort of the show and, show and tell part of the lecture. I, in honor of the Carpenter case, uh, I bought a tie that actually has the text of the Fourth Amendment on here. So, <laughs> so I con consulted in the original, in the original writing from, from the 18th century. I thought of wearing it tonight, um, but it kind of looks like I'm in a wedding when I, when I wear this tie. So, I figured that was a little bit of an odd signal to, to send. Um, so so uh, the history of the Fourth Amendment is based, uh, in, in terms of why it was enacted, it was largely a response to a series of abuses by the English king uh, in the decades leading up to the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, and probably the most important case that influenced the passage of the Fourth Amendment was a case called Entech versus Carrington. Uh, which uh, was about 15, 20 years before the Revolutionary War in England. Uh, and in that case, uh, Entech was a, a critic of the king, and the king's officials searched Entech's house and took away all of his papers, 
uh, uh, pursuant to an order that had been signed by the Secretary of State, uh, one of the king's officials, Lord Halifax, saying, you know, hey, officials who are executing this warrant, you can go anywhere and look for evidence and take any evidence relating to criticism of the king. Uh, so the English king was particularly upset about people criticizing him. Uh, and so the, the, the order allowed the king's officials, uh, Carrington and, and, and the rest, to go look anywhere and find evidence of, of, of criticism of the king. Uh, the court in Entek versus Carrington said that that was impermissible. It was a violation of the principle against unreasonable searches and seizures because the government had this order, the warrant, was not based on sufficient cause. It was not particular, it was not based on sufficient cause. Basically, in order to break into someone's house and take away their stuff, the court held, you need to have a real court order. You need to have a warrant based on probable cause, uh, and needs to be specific as to what the information, uh, what the stuff is that the government agents are looking for. So uh, the text of the Fourth Amendment can be understood as, in significant part, a response to Entek versus Carrington. And if you look at the history at the 18th century, there's really not much as to what the uh, drafters of the Fourth Amendment had in mind in terms of the details. But you can think of the Fourth Amendment as being understood at the time as being the don't break into someone's house and take stuff away uh, uh, amendment unless you've got a pretty good reason, unless you've got a, a warrant that is basically a defense to the trespass of breaking into someone's house. Uh, and so the idea of the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, that is you can't arrest people, you can't break into their house, you can't take away their papers, you can't take away their effects, uh, uh, unless there are good reasons to do so, um, uh, such, such as a warrant. The, the tricky part of the Fourth Amendment is that the language, unreasonable searches and seizures, can be understood to mean a lot of different things. So it's probably the case, the sort of classic fact pattern that, that the uh, Fourth Amendment was responding to was breaking into a house and taking away someone's papers. Uh, and so a search would be the physical intrusion, the breaking in, uh, and the seizure would be the taking away of the physical stuff. Uh, at the same time, you could interpret that language very differently from those uh, uh, facts. So think of just the word search. What does it mean to search? Well, uh, you could search in the sense of I'm searching through a closet to look for my shoes, uh, uh, or I'm, look, I'm searching through something as in rummaging through it. That was the Entek versus Carrington sense, uh, rummaging through Entek's house to find the papers that he had. Um, but search could be something else. Search could just mean look for something. I'm, I'm, searching for, uh, I'm searching for something across the room. I'm looking out and I'm searching for a friend of mine in the audience. I'm not rummaging through the audience. I'm just observing. I'm looking, trying to find something. Uh, or it could mean looking at something very closely. You might sort of you know, look, up the, look at the Big Dipper and look for the Big Dipper, search for it. It could mean looking intensely. There are lots of different meanings of the word search. And the fact that the Fourth Amendment seems to have been enacted in response to one particular fact pattern doesn't tell us how broadly the principle should apply. The notion of what does it mean to search and to search someone's person's house, not papers, and effects um, is itself something that the history doesn't really answer. That's made even more complicated by the fact that uh, in the 19th century, there's almost no case law on what the Fourth Amendment means. Uh, so the way that we lawyers generate un clear understandings of what the law is, is we take these sort of vague concepts like unreasonable searches and seizures, and we have legal disputes on them in which one side says this was an unreasonable search and seizure, the other says it wasn't, and then some judge says, okay, here's what this uncertain concept actually means, and draws a line and, and gives meaning to the concept that could on its, on its face have lots of different interpretations. Uh, and in order to have clarity from those big concepts, you need cases. And in the 19th century, there just weren't many cases. And you might wonder why. How could we go you know, over 100 years with almost nothing in the way of cases? And there were uh, three really good reasons why there were almost no, no cases. First, the whole idea of having professional police officers was something that didn't come around until the mid to the end of the 19th century. 
So at the time of the founding, most law enforcement was private law enforcement. It was not police officers walking the beat. It would be individuals, victims of crime, that were trying to uh, collect evidence, that were bringing prosecutions. There were even private prosecutions. The idea of the state being in charge, of having a state police, uh, of even just FBI agents, something like that, that's a much later uh, uh, idea, and of course that's the world in which we live in. So uh, there weren't these police that were regulated by the, by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and then to add to that, it wasn't until the mid-20th century that the Fourth Amendment was understood to apply to the state governments or to local governments. So the original design was that the uh, Fourth Amendment was to the federal constitution, and, and that meant it applied to the federal government, and there was not much of a federal government until the 20th century. The, the, the job of being the United States attorney, that would be the lead prosecutor in a district, it was a part-time job until the 20th century. You'd be the U.S. attorney, and then you'd also have your law practice, because you couldn't be a full-time U.S. attorney. Today, if you're the U.S. attorney, you're the head of a staff of maybe 100 assistant U.S. attorneys. Very, very different at the time. Finally, it wasn't until the 20th century that there were the remedies for Fourth Amendment violations that we know today, uh, and in particular, the exclusionary rule. Uh, the exclusionary rule is this idea that if the government broke, broke the rules, they, uh, the evidence that they obtained unconstitutionally can't be used in court. That's a really, really powerful engine of getting cases decided. Because if you're a criminal defendant and the government broke the rules or maybe just might have broken the rules in collecting evidence against you, you have a lawyer who can move to suppress the evidence and there's your case. Uh, you get a case. Uh, in the Fourth Amendment, thanks to the exclusionary rule, became uh, one of, if not the most litigated areas of constitutional law because the Fourth Amendment came to apply to the states and under the exclusionary rule, there's a strong incentive for criminal defendants uh, to file cases. So in the 20th century, you start getting cases on what this prohibition on unreasonable search and seizure really means. Uh, and yet, even today, we still haven't really settled on a good answer to this question. It wasn't until 1967 that the Supreme Court, or really any justice, articulated a test for what it means for the government to search. If you look at the cases before 1967, they would always just reason by analogy. They'd say, well, we know breaking into a house, that's clearly a search. Uh, and we know looking at somebody outside, that's not a search. And so the few cases that would come up until the 1960s, they just sort of reason by analogy. Well, this is like uh, speaking uh, public observation, or this is like breaking into someone's home. And there was no actual test to determine, well, when is the search occurring? The most important question, because it determines what is regulated under the law. Uh, and so when the Supreme Court finally did come up with a test, the, the test they came up with was based on a concurring opinion uh, by Justice Harlan in the Katz versus United, uh, United States case in 1967. Uh, and, and his test, uh, I think, in a lot of ways, just made the question more confusion, confusing uh, because it, the language that Harlan used itself can be subject to a lot of different interpretations. Here's what Justice Harlan said. It, it, a government search occurs when, first, someone exhibits a subjective expectation of privacy, and then, second, it's an expectation of privacy that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. Okay. Um, well, what, what exactly does that mean? Just think of the first part of that test, exhibiting a subjective expectation of privacy. That could mean two very different things. That could mean exhibiting an expectation, as in objectively doing things which show you're keeping people out. Or it could just mean having a subjective expectation. And in the law, we think of a subjective expectation as being just what someone's thinking, what's going through their mind. So maybe if they don't, in their mind, expect privacy, maybe they don't have privacy rights, a result that the Supreme Court has said, no, no, that can't be what we mean. But they've never quite said what we do mean by this subjective expectation prong. And if you think that's uncertain, try the next prong. Uh, if society is prepared to recognize your expectation of privacy as reasonable. Okay, well, who is society, and how do you know what they're prepared to accept? 
Uh, how do you how do you ask them? Do you um, uh, uh, is it something else? Is this a normative consideration? What what exactly is going on? Uh, in, in an article uh, that I published about ten years ago, I broke down the cases, uh, up, Supreme Court cases, applying this reasonable expectation of privacy idea, and I found there were four different explanations the Supreme Court used uh, to explain why an expectation of privacy was reasonable and therefore a government search had occurred, typically requiring a warrant, uh, and when there was no reasonable expectation of privacy. And, and here, here's what I found. In some cases, the Supreme Court used what I called a probabilistic approach or probabilistic model. That is, they interpreted the phrase reasonable expectation of privacy sort of literally. If you're a reasonable person, what do you expect to happen? Uh, and an example of this, uh, there was a case, Bond versus United States. Somebody is uh, on a bus and the police come along and squeeze Bond's duffel bag. And the Supreme Court says, well, a reasonable bus passenger is not going to expect another bus passenger to grab their luggage and squeeze for what it turned out was a brick of drugs inside the duffel bag. Uh, so that violates a reasonable expectation of privacy. On the other hand, in other cases, the Supreme Court has said what the reasonable expectation of privacy means absolutely has nothing to do with whether a reasonable person would expect privacy. No, that's not what we're doing at all. So you say, wait a minute. In one case, that is what you did, and in the other case, you say that's not what you're doing. Well, in other cases, the Supreme Court uses what I've called a private facts model, uh, which is in these other cases, the Supreme Court says, let's figure out if the government obtained really sensitive information. If the government obtained sensitive inform information, then a search occurred, and if they didn't obtain very sensitive information, no search occurred. And an example of this, there was a, a case, Illinois versus Cabalas, involving a drug-sniffing dog who was walked around the outside of a car. Uh, and uh, the drug-sniffing dog alerted to the presence of drugs inside the car. And Cabalas argued that that use of the drug-sniffing dog was a search, violated his reasonable expectation of privacy. And, and in an opinion by Justice Stevens, the court says, no, that didn't violate a reasonable expectation of privacy because a drug-sniffing dog uh, can only do two things. Uh, can either, uh, an alert is going to either indicate it, it, uh, the dog will alert, and that means that there's drugs inside. And the fact that you have narcotics inside your car, you, that's not something you're entitled to privacy on. Uh, the, the Fourth Amendment is sort of focused on more important things, what's inside your home uh, or, or you know, intimate activities. That's mere presence of narcotics. That's not it. Or the dog might not alert, and that will indicate that you don't have narcotics, and that's really not particularly interesting information either. And so the facts that were learned by the use of the dog uh, don't amount to a search under this private facts approach. In other cases, the Supreme Court doesn't rely on the private facts approach. Uh, so, so again, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. A third approach, sometimes the justices rely on positive law. Uh, that is some source of law outside the Fourth Amendment. Uh, maybe it's property law, long-standing tradition to look at property law. In, in, uh, so, some, not, not sort of the technical aspects of property law, uh, but whether it's their stuff, their house. If it's your property, you're likely to have a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in, in, the, in the item. Uh, and so sometimes they look at positive law, and then other times the justices don't look at positive law. They've, uh, uh, other times they scoff at the idea that you would look to, uh, uh, for example, state law and trying to figure out when an expectation of privacy is reasonable. Um, so sometimes they look at that, sometimes they don't. Uh, and finally, in some cases, the Supreme Court just says a reasonable expectation of privacy, they justify it based on the consequences of a ruling that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy or there isn't. In other words, they say we need there to be a reasonable expectation of privacy, or these are circumstances where this, it's not so important that we recognize a reasonable expectation of privacy. In effect, they're justifying the result based on whether it's a good rule or a bad rule, and the justices mix and match in their opinions. What this means, I think, is that the fundamental meaning of this reasonable expectation of privacy test is itself unresolved. And we end up with uh, a gap, uh, an uncertainty at what I think of as, as the um, framework level of the law. Uh, you can recite the test reasonable expectation of privacy, but trying to figure out what that means, you can look at different cases and it has different meanings in these different circumstances. Uh, and uh, the result is that we get a lot of clarity once the rule is announced in a particular case. So the Supreme Court in the Kabbalist case says 
Use of the drug-sniffing dog is not a search. In the Bond case, squeezing the duffel bag is a search. And we get cases uh, with lots of different fact patterns, uh, uh, mostly generated by the exclusionary rule, uh, in which uh, the, uh, the law becomes clear in its application, but the big picture question of, well, what is this reasonable expectation of privacy test even doing is itself kind of up for grabs. Let me add one more complication to it, and then I'll finally come back to the, the Carpenter case. In a 2012 decision, United States versus Jones, uh, the uh, majority of the Supreme Court said, well, before we embarked on this whole reasonable expectation of privacy um, uh, uh, inquiry, we used to have a trespass test. Uh, which was if, if the government trespassed onto somebody's property, then it was a search. And so we're going to reintroduce that. We, Justice Scalia wrote the opinion sort of with this sense of like, I don't know why we've forgotten about this prior test. It's been there all along. Um, to which everyone sort of scratched their heads and said, well, we, the court never actually had this test, or at least to the extent they ever had it in 1967 in the Katz case, they said, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, and so the effect was to formally reintroduce a test which actually had never act been around. It's sort of a new test, implicit in some of the earlier cases, that if a physical intrusion occurred, that was deemed a search. But is a physical intrusion the same as a trespass? Well, trespass itself can mean lots of different things. If you Go back to Blackstone's commentaries, the classic common law treatise that so influenced American law. Blackstone says the idea of trespass can mean many different things. Uh, you can have a physical trespass onto land. You can have a broader trespass in the sense of some harm inflicted on someone in some sense. Sort of trespass itself is sort of an accordion-like principle. Uh, and so the case Carpenter comes to the Supreme Court uh, with just a tremendous amount of uncertainty. What does the reasonable expectation of privacy test mean? What does the trespass test mean? Uh, and in the Carpenter case, the, the stakes for the case in a lot of ways are not so much about the Carpenter case as about so many other kinds of high-tech surveillance. And let me talk a little, a little bit about why that's the case. Uh, so the Carpenter case happens to involve cell towers and collection of records from these third-party service providers, cell phone companies that we all uh, contract with to send and deliver our calls. Uh, well, Congress has enacted a law, the Stored Communications Act, which already requires a court order uh, signed by a judge whenever the government wants to obtain cell tower records. And that's under a standard, uh, a, re a, 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 a reasonable suspicion standard, akin to that required under the Fourth Amendment for the government to temporarily stop someone when the uh, officer thinks someone's engaged in a crime, specific articulable facts, reason to think that there's evidence of the crime uh, that will be obtained in, in, in the records. So it, at the outset, it's all agreed that yes, the government of course needs a court order by statute. And the exact difference between having a court order by statute in this case or a search warrant is itself probably not the most significant issue. Uh, in fact, some states have enacted search warrant requirements as a matter of state law. Those laws would be only binding on state officers. Uh, and those rules are in effect, and, and, and my sense is at least it's a plausible way of, of regulating uh, a cell, cell tower surveillance just from a policy perspective. Court order requirement under the Stored Communications Act seems plausible. The uh, probable cause standard also seems plausible. So the legislatures are actively involved in this already. The question is, what are the courts going to do? And it matters, uh, I think, more for all the other technologies that are potentially at, at stake in the Carpenter case than just cell tower surveillance. Because there are a lot of kinds of records that the government collects that are not uh, records that are so heavily regulated by statute as cell tower records. And what, what are some examples? Well. Um, Credit card records, bank records, records of who someone called uh, on their phone. Um, you can even think of a public camera surveillance when there's a, a camera outside that shows people. Uh, what if the government wants to put up a camera outside someone's home and watch them over time? Uh, 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 under traditional Fourth Amendment principles, uh, up until you know, a few years ago, you'd say the law here is pretty simple. Uh, the, under existing precedents, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. Why? Well, because the Supreme Court had said 
there's, this, uh, uh, there's a rule called the third party doctrine, which is that when you voluntarily disclose information to a third party, you don't have Fourth Amendment rights in it. I think the best way of understanding the third party doctrine is it's really an expression of the subjective expectation of privacy prong, the idea being that when you voluntarily disclose information to somebody, you have not manifested your subjective expectation. I can't tell you something and then say the government is not allowed to ask you about it. Uh, you may have rights if the government wants to talk to you about what you're going to turn over about me, but I give up my privacy rights once I've told you uh, 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 information. And you can see how this might apply in the, in the context of Carpenter. Uh, well, when you're using a phone, in order to, the phone can't work unless it's broadcasting location. That's how the phone works. So you're voluntarily using this device, which is disclosing the records to uh, a third party provider. Uh, and so that means you have, uh, under this third party doctrine, you've given up your Fourth Amendment rights in the records. The phone companies may have Fourth Amendment rights, uh, but you, the user, no longer have Fourth Amendment rights under these uh, existing cases on the third party doctrine. The question is whether the justices are going to go along with that approach. Uh, and and uh, uh, there's reason to think they won't, not only based on the argument, which I'll get to in, in just a second, but um, often the Supreme Court has, a, has uh, in, in the face of new technologies, they've been very sensitive to whether new technologies have upset the balance of power in terms of how much authority, how much power the government has to investigate criminal cases. How easy is it for the government to collect evidence? When a technology comes along and it makes it really easy for the government uh, to collect evidence, it tends to be the case that the justices say, we're going to increase Fourth Amendment protection to make sure those powers are not abused. Uh, on the other hand, when technology changes to make it harder for the government to investigate cases, it often happens that the Supreme Court says, we're going to actually tone back the Fourth Amendment rule to make sure that the government can still investigate cases. I've called this dynamic equilibrium adjustment, nice sort of fancy title, because when you're a law professor, you need to come up with a fancy title for everything. So the idea is it's sort of like when you're driving over uh, a, 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 a mountainous terrain. You know, when you go uphill, you, you add gas. Uh, when you go downhill, you take your foot off, off the pedal, or you, you're, you're less gas, to try to maintain roughly constant speed. And the justices historically have been quite sensitive to that dynamic. Uh, and we saw that in the Carpenter argument. The, the prior cases would suggest that, um, would suggest that the uh, uh, access of the historical cell site records was not a search under the uh, uh, third party doctrine cases. Uh, and the justices, the majority of the justices seem pretty resistant to that idea, I think because of this equilibrium adjustment idea. They, they, the, the big difference is that now everyone's carrying cell phones. Those records are basically existing for everyone. And the justices seemed quite attuned to the idea that, sure, maybe under current technology, the records are yielding um, you know, what neighborhood somebody's in, but that technology can change. And tomorrow's technology may be uh, show what room someone's in. Uh, and we don't want to have the government able to track individuals and obtain information about their locations without the Constitution having a say. Uh, that was a, 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 an instinct that several justices voiced, and I think we'll get a majority of, of the court. The really tricky question is how. If you're going to say that the Fourth Amendment protects cell site records, What's the test for what's protected and not protected with all the implications for um, web surfing records, credit card records, bank records, calling records, public surveillance? Uh, are all of those things, which traditionally were not deemed searches, are they now searches too? And the justices at the oral argument were really struggling to try to find a principle which they could grab onto to say that this is protected under the Fourth Amendment, and maybe we're not going to answer, or maybe those other techniques are not protected under the, under the Fourth Amendment. And the, there are a couple different tools they, they could use, um, and, and they were tried out at, at the oral argument. So one possibility is something following the probabilistic model that I, that I talked about earlier. Maybe the test should be whether 
people expect the government to collect this, these kinds of records. And Professor Toxin, who's here, has done some terrific empirical research on this, showing that people don't expect these sorts of records to be collected. It's surprising, and they think it's jarring uh, when these records are, are, um, are collected. And so maybe that should be the approach. Uh, I tend to think that that's a really hard approach to take because over time, attitudes shift. So, you know, I, I guess before you walked into this room, how many of you knew that cell towers were recording your general location? Probably, well, you came to this lecture, so probably a lot of you do. And most people probably don't know that, but once you learn it, it's hard to forget it. Uh, and so it's tricky, I think, for the justices if they want to have a constitutional rule based on technological ignorance, what happens if people learn, do you then have a different rule? And if they forget, do you switch back to the first rule? I think it's tricky to base a constitutional rule on understandings of technology. It's just not, not a, stable, uh, a stable approach, in, in, in my view. Another possibility is to base the standard on positive law. Say, well, when Congress or when state legislatures have enacted privacy rights, maybe that shows that, that that's the test. If they've enacted laws that regulate or prohibit this kind of conduct, uh, then that should be enough uh, to say sort of society is now prepared to recognize that expectation of privacy uh, as reasonable, society being kind of showing its cards through the legislative process. And I think that's problematic as well. Uh, first, because if the legislatures have enacted a rule in which they reject the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement, it seems a little bit sneaky to use the rejection of the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement as a basis for interpreting the Fourth Amendment to then have a Fourth Amendment require, uh, warrant requirement. Uh, sort of turns the half loaf into the full loaf. Uh, and and it, I think um, it's also tricky because once you say that the constitutional rule is dependent on what the statutes say, that makes it harder to enact new privacy statutes. So imagine the incentives from the Justice Department's perspective. The Justice Department is both investigating cases and also weighing in on privacy legislation at the federal level. Well, if someone proposes a new privacy law, under the, for the most part, the most common understanding has been that those con constitutional law and statutes are, are independent. Well, if you link the constitutional interpretation to the statute, then the Justice Department will start saying, we don't want that half-loaf law. We want no privacy at all because we want to avoid having the full privacy of the Fourth Amendment. So linking the statute and the Constitution may create some warped incentives in terms of not being able to get the statutory privacy laws uh, that we need. And the statutory rules are usually um, sub substantially more flexible. They can change quickly. They can be amended uh, uh, as compared to constitutional rules, which tend to lag the technology by a few decades and are relatively difficult to overturn. It seems to me that uh, if the court wants to rule for Carpenter, the best approach would be uh, using the private facts model, the idea that some records are particularly sensitive. And I would, I, what, I would, what I would do you know, is sort of imagine back that I'm a law clerk again, and, and, and my boss says, write the opinion for Carpenter. Here's, here's what, I, what I would do. I would say, uh, well, first we've got equ equilibrium adjustment. Uh, everyone's carrying a cell phone, and that means the government is able to collect these records. And if we don't have a constitutional rule, that means the government has more power to track people than it ever has in ways that the government could abuse. And that means that the law should step in. The, the Fourth Amendment rule, you know, the Fourth Amendment should be adjusted, put, put more gas uh, 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 as we're going uphill in order to, to maintain Fourth Amendment speed, if you will. Uh, and the way to do that would be to say location records are particularly sensitive kinds of information. And that when the government uh, is collecting location records enabled by these new technologies, whether it's GPS records or cell site records, the details of the technology wouldn't matter, that those records, because of the collective ability of the government uh, uh, to, to um, uh, uh, find out people's locations, uh, should be enough to make that a search, focus just on the private facts that are obtained. Uh, so that's, that's the approach that I think if the court wants to rule for Carpenter, they should take. Although I'll, I'll uh, also disclose, I filed a, 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 an amicus brief in the Carpenter case. I actually think the justices shouldn't say this is a matter of Fourth Amendment law at all. Uh, I think this is actually a question 
that is best resolved by statutes, uh, such as the Storage Communications Act and the state equivalent laws. And let me talk a little bit about why I think it's actually uh, would, would be a wrong turn to try to say that the Fourth Amendment regulates this. I, I think the way to think about Carpenter, the best way to think about it, is as a, we're undergoing this trans, a, 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 a switch from a physical world to a world of digital evidence, a world from physical space to network space. And, and Carpenter is an example of network-generated information. It's information uh, created and stored by the phone network as it's delivering calls. It seems to me the goal in applying the Fourth Amendment to this new network technology is to try to maintain some sort of equivalence between how the Fourth Amendment applies in the physical world and in the network world. And here's how I would, here's how, here is a proposal for how to do it. Well, in the physical world, the traditional rules going back to Entech versus Carrington are that we have Fourth Amendment rights in our houses, in inside spaces, uh, and we don't have Fourth Amendment rights out in public, outside. I think of this as the inside-outside distinction. Private spaces where we have Fourth Amendment rights, outside in public where we don't. I think a way to maintain that division in a network environment is to say that we have Fourth Amendment rights in the contents of communications, but not in non-content records. Uh, and we could recreate the um, uh, Fourth Amendment rules and the, the public space by saying effectively, non-content records about how the network delivered the communication is the network equivalent of being able to observe somebody in public space as they deliver a package. On the other hand, the contents of the communication is the network equivalent of the private conversation that had inside the home. Uh, and that we should try to match Fourth Amendment rules from the physical world to the network world in order to maintain privacy protections from that switch to the physical world to the network environment. I don't think that view will carry the day, and the, and the reason why is because that instinct of equilibrium adjustment is, I think, what's driving a majority of the justices. They're going to try to create an exception to the third party doctrine without being necessarily entirely sure of what the exception is. I mean, at the argument, they were grasping for principles. Okay, if we're going to create an exception to the rule, what should the exception be? I think it's tough to do that. Uh, it's really hard to come up with an administrable rule uh, uh, to, to rule for Carpenter, but I suspect they're going to, and if they do that, the best way to do that is by saying what really makes Carpenter different is the private facts here, the ability to obtain location information, which is just fundamentally different from anything we've seen before in a prior technological world, justifying the equilibrium adjustment. So the, the way that uh, uh, commentators always end discussions of pending Supreme Court cases is to say, a decision is expected by late June, uh, be, because that's when the justices finish up their cases for the term and go on vacation. So I will do the same and say, a decision is expected by late June. We'll have to see what they say. The implications are going to be dramatic, not just for cell site surveillance, but for all the other kinds of surveillance. The justices are aware of that, and I, I strongly suspect they're going to try to come up with the principles going forward that really determine how the digital, the, the Fourth Amendment applies in the new digital world we're in. So, so stay tuned, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, as a reminder, um, you're welcome uh, to log on to the Slido lab, app and um, uh, submit your questions, and also uh, click like on questions that you um, admire that other people have submitted that you would like to have answered. We have um, a number in the queue right now and a number that have um, proven to be really popular. All right. uh, let's start with one of them. Um, what do you make of Justice Gorsuch's property line of questioning during oral arguments in Carpenter? Do you anticipate any expansion of Riley that would view cell phone data as effects under the Fourth Amendment? So maybe you can explain that doctrine and that line of questioning. Yeah, great. Great question. So, so this was the biggest surprise uh, from the oral argument, uh, a, the views of Justice Gorsuch, new arrival at the Supreme Court, uh, who seemed to have kind of a really strong property view uh, 
of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, in United States versus Jones, the Supreme Court either revived or introduced, depending on how you look at it, this idea that trespass, property rights, should be governing uh, uh, the Fourth Amendment, or at least Fourth Amendment is governed by at least trespass and also by reasonable expectations of privacy. Justice Gorsuch seemed to have uh, an even broader idea that maybe um, you had property rights where there's legislation. Uh, this was uh, the positive law idea, and he, he actually mentioned an article uh, uh, by two law professors just from last, uh, last year suggesting that maybe you should have just a straight positive law model whenever there's legislation. That should mean the, the conduct is a search. Justice Gorsuch uh, seemed to suggest agreement with that, which would be a really radical transformation of what the Fourth Amendment search test has traditionally been about. Um, on one hand, everybody agrees, or it's widely agreed in the, in the cases that uh, the contents inside your cell phone are your effects, it's your property. In fact, in the drafting of the Fourth Amendment, the word effects was a late replacement for the word property. And of course, you never know when they replace a word, does that mean they meant something different from what they had? Or do they meant just a different word that means the same thing? Uh, but there's clearly a connection with property law. On the other hand, um, it would be pretty surprising if it turned out you had property rights in your cell site records. Probably most people don't know that they have cell site records. And if you call the phone company and say, I want my cell site records, they'll say, we won't give them to you. So it's an odd sort of property right uh, in something that someone else generated about how you use their network that you can't access and can't even know if it exists. Um, it would be a novel kind of idea, although my one takeaway I had after the uh, Carpenter argument was that uh, within a year or two, I predict about 50 to 100 new law review articles by Fourth Amendment scholars based on really novel theories of property. Yeah. Uh, because the sense I had from uh, the oral argument was that Justice Gorsuch was not just sort of saying, let's rely on the Jones case and this property idea. He was suggesting a pretty radical uh, libertarian approach, which would say a lot of things are searches, which traditionally uh, weren't searches. He's only one vote. Uh, and the other justices, I went to the argument and was watching the other justices as they reacted to Justice Gorsuch, and I think it's fair to say he did not have uh, other enthusiasts for his particular approach, although Justice Sotomayor seemed to smile that she knew she had Gorsuch's vote. Um, so, so I think you're going to have a lot of uh, law professors coming up with new theories of property law for Fourth Amendment purposes because the court is divided. There's you know, five Republican-nominated uh, justices and four Democratic-nominated justices. And for the most part, that divides roughly into a right versus left, you know, more law enforcement-oriented, more defense-oriented. If Justice Gorsuch is going to be a very libertarian vote, even sort of more defense-oriented in some cases than the more traditionally liberal justices, that's five votes pairing four pro-privacy votes with Gorsuch's property vote. Uh, it's going to create some really interesting situations because this, when there's no majority opinion of the Supreme Court, you have to figure out which of those decisions is controlling, and sometimes it's not clear. And when there are two totally different rationales that lead to five votes, you might not really be even able to tell what the rule is. Uh, but I sus suspect a lot of cases in the future are going to hinge on that. And I also suspect, if I had to guess, just Chief Justice Roberts may end up taking this opinion and writing it uh, for himself uh, in Carpenter's favor with one consequence of that being that Justice Gorsuch's property view will be a separate concurring opinion and not part of the controlling opinion of the court. Uh, I suspect uh, the court will want to have clarity here and not have to sort of combine a plurality with a concurring opinion, and that always just, it just gets confusing. So, so that was a dramatic uh, uh, development, and we'll have to see what he writes. You know, we've, we've seen the argument, but it's all, it's, you always have to wait till the opinion to really know where this is going. But it could be going some really interesting directions. Okay, we have a series of questions that uh, were submitted and then leapt to the top of the queue really quickly, all of which start, can the cops do blank? <laughs> uh, Favorite kind of question. People really want to know, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, three of them all together because it's just a list of things that can the cops do. Uh, get your pen. Okay. Can the cops use apps, like dating apps, to pinpoint your location, and do they? Uh, number two, I have heard that the police cannot force you to unlock your phone via a pin, but can force you to provide your fingerprint 
Is this correct? And if so, could the police also make you unlock your phone with your face um, if it's an iPhone X? Uh, finally, is the government allowed at any point to actively track someone's cell phone in live time? Basically, uh, this person says they're referring to pinpointing a person's location, like an E911, or gaining access directly to the person's phone or camera. All right. A lot of good, good questions. Let me take them uh, uh, starting in the opposite order. So can the government actively track someone? Uh, the statutes are clear that this requires a warrant. Uh, so as a matter of statutory law, you don't get into the constitutional question because the, the rules of, of criminal procedure uh, have been interpreted by most courts to require a warrant at the outset. And, and Justice Department policy is to always get a warrant for real-time tracking. Uh, and real-time tracking is much more precise because then the government can keep, can, can see all the records that were generated regardless of whether they were then deleted by the phone company. So with historical records, the phone company creates a lot of records, but they only keep a few of them. So the government can only access what the phone company decided to keep. Real time, they can get GPS records, they can get you know, triangulation uh, to get pretty, pretty high resolution uh, location records. That requires a warrant. Unlocking phones ends up being mostly a Fifth Amendment question. Uh, uh, so the Supreme Court has said you need a warrant to search the phone. What if the government has a warrant and the phone is locked? Uh, that goes to whether the government has the power under the Fifth Amendment if it violates the right against self-incrimination uh, to unlock a phone. Um, it is clear uh, biometric uh, 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 methods of unlocking a phone, those don't implicate the Fifth Amendment because they don't involve thoughts. Uh, they're not your own mind. It's just body parts. Uh, and so, it, it, at least so far, the courts have said no Fifth Amendment issues involved in forcing somebody to unlock a phone using uh, biometrics. Uh, whether the, how the Fifth Amendment applies to, uh, say, entering in a passcode is actually the subject of a lot of uncertainty right now. Some courts have suggested that the standard is only the government has to show they know it's that person's phone so that the, the government really isn't learning any particularly good information by making somebody unlock the phone. Other courts have suggested that the test is whether the government knows all of the files on the phone, uh, because ultimately that's the information the government is going to get. And there's uh, sort of a circuit split, not in the technical sense, but a lot of disagreement as to what those rules are under the Fifth Amendment, so, so stay tuned on that. Uh, in terms of the dating app question, uh, the, the government is allowed to use the apps that everybody else uses. Uh, they're allowed to uh, use the same, same techniques. Uh, so if there's a particular app that shows other users' locations, the government can use that. Uh, that's a, this is a technique that the government has used often in peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer networks when the government is looking for contraband images of child pornography. They will go undercover, essentially, uh, uh, as, a, as a user of the peer-to-peer -peer software and look for files that other uh, members of the peer-to-peer -peer network are having that are illegal to possess. Uh, on the other hand, trying to get records from the app provider, if there's even a, a, a provider that is storing those records, that would require a court order under the Stored Communications Act, and the rules for getting those records uh, haven't traditionally been constitutional, but they may be constitutional after Carpenter, so we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Um, next we have a sort of philosophical question. Does personal privacy even really exist anymore? Uh, or do the systemic requirements of modern technology make tracking a given? Is government even the biggest threat to our privacy? Yeah, big, big questions. Uh, personal privacy does still exist, uh, 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 fortunately. I, 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 think, I think the way to see this is kind of a cat and mouse game. Um, there are technologies that expand government power, and cell site surveillance is one of them. There are these records the government can access that they didn't used to be able to, to access. Uh, on the other hand, there are also ways of thwarting government surveillance that didn't used to exist. Uh, a good example of this is encryption. Uh, so you can encrypt your data. You can, in fact, your devices uh, de encrypt very strongly by default. That's why there's this issue of unlocking phones and, and whether the government can make you uh, uh, divulge your passcode to, to unlock a phone. And, and importantly, that is, the, can the government get access to the phone even when they have a Fourth Amendment search warrant? So sure, they can break into your house, but they can't get into your phone unless they can get, uh, 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 get you to unlock it. And that's as a matter of technology. So the technology, I think, worth, works both ways. Some technologies expand government power, and some technologies restrict government power. And 
surveillance in one way, encryption the other way. And it's actually, I think, difficult to come up with a consistent answer to which direction the technology is going. I think, I think it's, it's just a, a back and forth, and it may be dependent on which technologies you decide to use uh, and, and what records are being collected um, uh, uh, based on that technology. Um, in terms of whether we should be worrying about government surveillance versus private sector surveillance, this is uh, a, a, a constant question which different countries tend to answer differently. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so in, if you compare privacy rules in the United States and Fourth Amendment traditions and historical traditions with that in, in Europe, they just have a different set of concerns. In the U.S., we're really worried about government surveillance. In Europe, they're worried about private sector surveillance. What do private companies have about you? Uh, it's just a different tradition, uh, uh, intellectual tradition, and I don't really think one is right or wrong. It's just different ways of approaching the same problem. Okay, uh, this person has a question about uh, two different lines of Supreme Court precedent. Um, should there be any difference in treatment between data collected from a car GPS device and cell phone tower data? Yeah, so um, the, the biggest difference, there was a, the, the Jones case that I mentioned from a few years ago was a GPS case, and in that case, the government installed the GPS device on a car, and the Supreme Court said it was the installation of the device, which was the trespass. Um, one big difference uh, between GPS surveillance and uh, cell site surveillance is that in the case of GPS surveillance, it's the government installing the device on the person's car, which the Supreme Court has said is a trespass, is a search, and lower courts have said requires a warrant, and collecting records that a private party has generated in the ordinary course of business. So if... if, if there's a potentially a very significant difference between those two. One is government action to create the record, and the other is merely collecting something that a private party has already collected. Why does that matter so much? It matters so much because the Fourth Amendment only applies to the government. So the fact that people know something about you because they've seen you do something, that's not a constitutional concern. The traditional rule is the government is allowed to um, interview eyewitnesses. If you do something in front of other people or you tell other people about things that you've done, the government is allowed to interview uh, other people about what they saw you do. Uh, and, and this is just the eyewitness rule. And in fact, in uh, Carpenter, the government is relying heavily on that, that eyewitness rule, effectively saying that cell phone companies are eyewitnesses to the calls that they're delivering. They're, they're, they're sort of in the network observing. Um, so there's potentially a significant difference between those two, but you can look at them from a, a, a different perspective, a private facts approach, and say, well, what really matters is what information is the government collecting? And, and from that perspective, it may not make that much of a difference at all. And, and, and I suspect this is something that uh, a bunch of Supreme Court justices are right now trying to figure out as they craft the rule probably ruling for Carpenter, you know, which does matter? You know, do, does it make a difference that these records were created by third parties and the government's just collecting them? Or do we want to just focus on the information? And, and are we worried about the government collecting information no matter uh, what the technical details are as to how they obtained it? So, so just two different ways of looking at it, I think. Okay, this next question I think ties in um, nicely to the last comment that you made. If the court adopts a private facts style test where the third party doctrine doesn't apply to sensitive information like cell data, does that essentially kill the doctrine, i.e. limit it to telephone numbers and bank documents? Uh, so I think it doesn't. Um, I, I, think, I think the third party doctrine, the, the, the real question, if, if, assuming the Supreme Court rules for Carpenter, is not is there a third party doctrine, it's to what cases does the third party doctrine apply? Uh, and so there are hundreds of different kinds of records that are generated by networks that are non-content records which traditionally uh, would be considered outside the scope of Fourth Amendment protection. And I think a rule that focuses on location information just sort of bites off that little piece, basically GPS records, cell site records, things that are primarily about figuring out where someone is, uh, that could be just limited to those new kinds of, of records. Uh, what, what's tricky to my mind is if, when, you, when you frame equilibrium adjustment, the idea is you need to kind of restore the prior equilibrium. 
And there are different ways of, you don't, there's no mathematical tool. It's not like you turn the crank and the correct equilibrium comes out or you sort of do a mathematical equation and it tells you that. Um, so some would say all of these new records that are being created, the fact that the government can get all of these records uh, and they're so detailed and they're maintained, all of them are sensitive and they should all be part of this e equilibrium adjustment. You could take a narrower approach and say, no, the only thing that's really changed implicated by Carpenter is location information, just location records, and these other records that the government is collecting, whether it's public surveillance or bank records or numbers dialed, uh, those are uh, a different category. Uh, it's it's going to be a tricky problem for them to grapple with. I think the benefit of just focusing on location information is they can rule narrowly and save the scope of the third party doctrine for, in other circumstances, for another day. Once you start getting into the details of which cases should be uh, covered by the third party doctrine and which shouldn't, you know, uh, this way madness lies, I think. Uh, and and, and I, I should say, so I'm, I'm a law professor, obviously, and I go to conferences and other Fourth Amendment scholars, and I ask the critics of the third party doctrine, okay, what's your rule? Which cases are covered by a third party doctrine and which aren't? And I, people do not answer. <laughs> they say, listen, we don't need a rule. I say, well, at some point we're going to need answers. What, you're you know, a Fourth Amendment scholar, what is your answer? Justice, I, this is an answer I, I, I sometimes get from law professors. Judges are very smart people, and they can figure it out. And then I've spoken to judicial groups, and, and, and like circuit conferences and like, and I say, this is what the professors say. And that frightens the judges. The judges are like, we can't, we're generalists. We just get a Fourth Amendment case that's you know, in our docket with hundreds of other cases. We have you know, a, a week to figure out what to do with this case. We can't answer it. You know, let the scholars figure it out. No one wants to answer how the, what the test should be, uh, at least other than a very general sort of we'll figure it out later standard. I think because once you get into it, it's really hard to distinguish and even come up with a test for what the records are that are covered or not covered. And no one that I've found at least says that all records, all third party records should be protected, uh, which would be sort of the equivalent in the internet world of saying, you know, the police, once they go outside, have to keep their eyes closed. They're not, absorbed, not allowed to observe anything. And I think that would be very troublesome in terms of trying to maintain that balance between privacy rights uh, and public safety. The hard question is how to figure out which records are included and not included. Very easy for legislatures to do that, right? They just say, okay, here's the scope that we're picking. You know, the Historic Communications Act has this scope, telecommunications records covered by these providers. Uh, easy for legislatures to do it, really hard for courts to do it. So the challenge that the justices have of trying to come up with a rule is I think a really tricky one, not, not, not an easy one. And we'll have to see what they do. Okay, this is another um, issue involving uh, law enforcement that made a splash in the news that um, immediately after the uh, question was posted, it uh, made its way to the top of the list. Uh, can you explain why didn't Apple help the FBI unlock a, uh, the phone a few years ago? I think the short answer is dollars. <laughs> um, if you're a business that sells your products based on privacy and your edge in the marketplace is in part the truly extraordinary privacy offered by your business, not only in the United States but around the world, I mean, uh, you, you, a minority of your, uh, only some of your business in the U.S., you're a global business. If you're making the devices you want everyone to know your device is as secure as possible because it's good for business. It may also be good for the world. That's actually a really hard question of what's the right answer in terms of uh, a policy a business should have for the, for the world. But for business, it's actually pretty clear, especially, I think, uh, uh, after the Snowden disclosures. So the Apple versus FBI dispute happened not long after the Snowden disclosures. Uh, which had two significant impacts. One was in Silicon Valley, uh, which has a pretty libertarian ethos, uh, a lot of fears of government surveillance from the United States, uh, and then probably as importantly or more importantly, around the world concerns of gov U.S. government surveillance. So if you're a United States company trying to sell your products, um, 
we cooperate with the United States in decrypting is not really great for business. So I suspect that explains uh, a lot of the, the um, you know, why Apple really um, t took the position it did. There's a broader question, though, which is to what extent are these third-party companies, you know, should, should they be regulated? Should, should it be the public that determines the choices that they make, or should it be up to the companies? And this is, I think, a, a common question. It's common with Carpenter, and it's common with the Apple versus FBI dispute. Because in, in all of these situations, you've got businesses that are basically making the technological world. Apple is making the iPhone. They're making the operating system. The, um, the cell phone providers are deciding, we're going to keep these records and not those records. Here's how long we're going to keep them for. Um, those are private companies making the decisions about how privacy rights should work. And they're doing that in a way responsive ultimately to not just customers in the United States, but global customers. It may be that the decisions that the, the, those companies are making are good privacy decisions. It may be that the ones that they're making are actually not good privacy decisions. And in the past, the government has been very hands-off in terms of letting businesses make the decisions that they think is best for their, their company. I, I, I'm not sure that attitude is going to be maintained in the future over time, especially as we become sort of more dependent on the technological world and more dependent on the technological choices that are being made by companies. Uh, 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 that attitude may shift. Uh, and, and so there may be uh, more government saying Either you know, you're, you're, uh, a phone has to be something that is decryptable in some way under some particular circumstances, or you can imagine a rule saying, you know, if the Supreme Court says uh, a, a warrant is required to access cell phone records, maybe Congress will say, okay, that's fine, but we also want the phone companies to keep the following records so that when we come with our warrant, here are the records that we can get. Right now, that's unregulated. A phone company could just say, we don't keep any location records. That'd be totally legal to do that. Um, so there is this interplay between private companies that are defining the technological world we're in and governments which can tell the companies what to do. Although the companies are global, they still have you know, a, a big role to play. And those are choices which you know, all of us are going to be making through the, through the elected process. OK, we have uh, time for uh, just a couple more. Uh, this questioner takes the position, uh, metadata reveals incredibly detailed and personal information when aggregated, even over sh relatively short time frames. If the Fourth Amendment doesn't speak to that privacy interest, what is left of it? Great question. So uh, the aggregation idea uh, was one uh, really introduced to the Supreme Court in the Jones case that I mentioned involving the installation of the GPS device. And there were concurring opinions that were filed in that case which suggested that um, short-term surveillance maybe isn't a search, but long-term surveillance becomes a search, aggregation uh, over time. And so monitoring somebody through a GPS device uh, for a day might not be a search, but when it's done for 28 days, the facts of Jones, that collectively is giving the government so much power that that becomes a search. And I, I, I hear equilibrium adjustment when I hear that kind of argument. It's like, hey, the government is learning so much stuff, there should be a constitutional response uh, to that concern. Uh, the Carpenter, in the Carpenter case, relied heavily on this aggregation principle. Uh, that was the lead argument that Carpenter made, relying on the fact that in this Jones case, just a few years ago, there were five justices that seemed to have adopted or be you know, in favor of an aggregation principle. So Jones leads in by saying, and the, the government obtained 127 days of cell site records, and this longer-term surveillance is a search, which in the, media, the justices immediately pounced and said, longer term, shorter term, what difference does that make? Um, you know, how short is too short? How long is long enough? Uh, 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 shouldn't it just be, you know, it's either on or off? Uh, fascinating, because it was the justices themselves, or at least five of them, that suggested that this principle should be uh, recognized in the Fourth Amendment, short-term versus long-term surveillance, uh, and to have the justices then be pretty skeptical of that line uh, uh, was a, a fascinating development. I think it's ultimately correct that, that justices should not try to use this short-term, long-term distinction because it's really hard to implement. Um, how long is long-term enough? You know, if you say a week of surveillance is enough, 
What if they, the government then takes a week off? Do they start the clock again? Can they do another week? Or is it collective? What if it's a different officer? What if they turn on the surveillance tool for an hour a day? Does you count only an hour that day? Or is that a full day? You're going to have you know, the justices coming up with like an extraordinarily complex set of rules to implement that. I don't, I don't think they can do that. And based on the argument in Carpenter, I don't think they want to. The answer, I think, is you know, this is sort of classic equilibrium adjustment. If, if aggregation enabled by a technology is, is really a reality and a concern that it so much changes the balance of power, then you adjust, the courts adjust for that technology across the board not in the short-term, long-term sense, but in all senses. So if the court rules that collecting cell site records is a search, I hope they say collecting all cell site records is a search. It doesn't matter if the government collects one day or two days or 42 hours or between 8 and 9 p.m. on every Tuesday for a year. Um, I hope they don't try to enact a short-term versus long-term rule, but instead do equal equilibrium adjustment up across the board. I think that's the only way to come up with a constitutional rule uh, that judges can implement. Uh, obviously, legislatures can do that sort of complicated rule more carefully, but for courts, I don't think they can get into long-term versus short-term in a way that, that they can actually implement. Okay, I think this is our uh, last question. Um, and the, uh, the biggest vote-getter, um, next to the plea that you uh, take advantage of every opportunity to urge Justice Kennedy to stay on the bench, which got a lot of votes, um, but it's not a question. Um, how will this decision affect legal searches under FISA? Ooh. Yeah, so FISA is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and that involves uh, uh, surveillance tools in the national security uh, context, uh, uh, both in the context of uh, uh, monitoring spies inside the United States or potential terrorist suspects inside the United States, but also monitoring people outside the United States. Uh, and uh, the three-letter agencies like the NSA are, gonna, are watching Carpenter extremely closely. Um, they're not telling us that because they don't tell us anything, but trust <laughs> me, they're watching it really closely because um, the surveillance rules that are announced in criminal cases, for the most part, also apply in the national security environment. Now, there's some limits on that, so there's this question of who has Fourth Amendment rights at all. Uh, traditionally, somebody outside the United States who's not a U.S. citizen, who doesn't have any voluntary contacts with the United States, wouldn't have Fourth Amendment rights. So a Carpenter ruling couldn't impact that. Um, but you know, what three-letter agencies like the NSA do is conduct surveillance and conduct signal surveillance. Uh, and Carpenter is basically going to be the case that creates the framework uh, under which those agencies work. So it's going to be tremendously important and maybe its biggest short-term impact will be on the national security side where we don't really hear about it, uh, but it'll be making a big impact. Okay, please join me in thanking Professor Kerr for his Thank time. You. And time. Thank you.